Okay. So I'm going to read just a little introduction sure. about you, right. and then we'll start chatting. Um, and if you care to look ahead, this is kind of what... I can't see, can't see that far. <laughs> That's all right. Okay, okay. Brother Paul Quinnen is a monk of the Abbey of Gethsemane for over 50 years. He is a poet, photographer, and lover of nature. His books include The Art of Pausing, Unquiet Vigil, Monks Wear, Afternoons with Emily, Bells of the Hours, Laughter, My Purgatory, and most recently, In Praise of the Useless Life, a monk's memoir. Praised by Kathleen Norris as a book that strikes me as valuable in a culture so terribly marred by narcissism. Brother Paul is known to many by way of their saunters with him to Thomas Merton's former hermitage and the stories he shares from his time with Merton as his spiritual director and mentor. His latest book explores these things and much more including a glimpse into the monastic life, which he describes as essentially a, va a vacating and emptying out. Brother Paul, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Glad you're here. Um, so we'd like to start, our, our first question is always, um, if you have like an early memory of an encounter with silence or when maybe you realized silence was something important to you or for you. Oh. Even back well, in childhood, or yeah, uh, I th lived uh, in in College Park, which was a, a, a holler down below the college, <laughs> and uh, 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 up just a little ways from us was the uh, football field, and then beyond that was a woods. So I used to like to go up and go into the woods by yeah. myself. Mm. I was weird. <laughs> <laughs> That's not weird. <laughs> no, it's not, but it's a good... Uh, and, you know, we had a big family, so there was plenty of noise in the house. Um, mm. I can't say that uh, there was any, uh, any particular experience I had as a child, that, except that, you know, I, I liked... Uh, I didn't like noisy sports. <laughs> I, mean, I liked family games, you know. yeah. but otherwise, I, I, there's nothing that strikes me yeah. as being particularly meaningful in my childhood. Mm -hmm. And you came to the monastery when you were 17, is that right? Yeah, I came 17, and okay. uh, we did have retreats at the Catholic school. And uh, one of the best experiences I had at that school, among the very few, was that uh, we had a school retreat and uh, everybody had to keep silence. So there we were, going up and down the stairs in silence, and I thought that was wonderful. It was one of my favorite weeks in, the, <laughs> in school. Yeah. So I would say that maybe that was a, a significant uh, taste of uh, a silence in, in community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, you came here uh, before Vatican II. Oh yes. So the silence was a little more strict, and I know there's a there's a quote from your book about that. Um, you talked about the strictness of silence and how it impacted your senses. Mm -hmm. um, and do you do you still feel like that happens for you here? Even? Oh yes. Well, okay. it uh, it's it's a matter of habit now. Yeah. Uh, I can you know readily access you know other parts of my soul uh, being in silence because I, you know, I've developed that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So what initially led you here at 17? Didn't, well, wasn't it, uh, you read Seven Story Mountain, is that right? I read Seven Story Mountain, but I was already interested in monasticism thanks to uh, reading The Imitation of Christ, mm -hmm. which was really written for novices. Mm -hmm. So he, he makes, um, you know, the book is written as a dialogue between Christ and the soul. Mm. So reading the book kind of gets you into a pattern of conversation. And that, I discovered, was really, uh, uh, I mean, it wasn't just reading something, but there was really a personal con communion going on in that process. Yeah. And, uh, of course, it's very strong on, 
you know, rejecting the ways of the world and, and the disappointments and delusions of the world. And um, I was right for that <laughs> at that time. Yeah. So, uh, and then I thought, well, I guess I'll have to go to Europe and enter a monastery. I didn't know there were any monasteries in, in mm -hmm. the United States. But I had learned some French in school, and I thought, well, I could go to France and <laughs> join a French monastery. Maybe that's what I should have done. But uh, mm -hmm. then I read Seven Story Mountain. Oh, there's a, a monastery in the United States, yeah. so I can go there. And then I went to the parish priest, and I said, well, uh, what would be a monastery I could go to? And he opened the Catholic directory and pointed to the Abbey of Gethsemane. Not mm -hmm. as if there weren't other monasteries on that list. Right. For some reason, he just pointed to that one. <laughs> so I thought, I guess that's the only one, so I can do it. <laughs> and um, I love the story you tell in your most recent book about not realizing Father Lewis was Thomas Merton. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, he seemed like a... Um, he was the novice master, as far as I was concerned. Mm -hmm. He was kind of a... Um, you know, had a, had a spark about him, and, you know, spoke imaginatively when he did. Um, so, as a result, I had established a re relationship with him as my novice master, rather than as a famous writer who, whose book I had read. Mm -hmm. And so that, that, I, I didn't have to clear all that stuff away. It, it didn't get in my way. And then after a month, I had established a relationship to him as a you know, a novice master. Yeah. So the rest of the, it didn't, um, it didn't interfere with the relationship. Yeah. And he, you know, he wasn't inclined to talk about his writing much. A lot of it going on, you, you could see it. Um, but uh, no, that, that, he just stuck to business as, <laughs> as the novice master. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was reading something about how much he would laugh and tell jokes that he liked. Yeah. He really... Well, you can see that in the uh, tapes, you know, his, mm. his conferences. Yeah, um, yeah. Very quick, quick, yeah, witted. <laughs> um, so, also in this last book, you talk a lot about your love of nature and being outside and even sleeping outside. Yeah. Um, and I especially loved the story about the bird you befriended. <laughs> yeah, the walk mockingbird. Yeah. Well, it's more of an enemy than a friend. <laughs> Battle of wits with the mockingbird. Yeah, it was a really nice story, just the way you handled that. And, um, and you also tell a story about uh, when you initially came here, um, someone had said something to you about, you know, you're not going to get enlightenment from sitting under a tree, but oh. <laughs> that's precisely what you've been doing to some degree. Oh yes, I did it yesterday afternoon. Too. Oh, did you? <laughs> <laughs> um, In that hot weather, you know, the thing is that uh, the ground is cooler. Mm. So if you sit right on the ground, you've got that coolness, and then you have an ice drink to go with it, yeah. and a breeze, and uh, the clouds were very uh, dramatic yesterday afternoon. Mm. Um, I don't know, it just made, it's a great context to, to spend an hour. So even on this, the hottest day of the year, do you sleep outside? Oh yeah, well, it, it's uh, actually it's cooler <laughs> sleeping outside than inside. Yeah. You know, this uh, monastery is built out of brick, and it's like an oven. It, it retains the heat mm. overnight. Whereas if you're outside, it'll cool down, mm -hmm. and you might have to add a, a, a second sheet or something like that at this at this time of the year. Yeah, one sheet's enough. And, uh, a second sheet might take you through the whole night, um, <laughs> and then of course you add blankets if, you know, according to what you need. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. You said you had you have a big family. How many? Siblings? Well, there were uh, four boys and two girls. Okay. And I had a twin sister. Okay. Yeah. Do you get to see them very much? Or? Oh well, they they come here. Mm -hmm. You know that's that's our rule. You know mm -hmm. we don't go home to visit. Right. But the the families can come here and visit, mm -hmm. and it's a three day visit. Okay. Usually, well, two nights is what it ends up to be. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, and Pico Ayer wrote the intro to your yeah. book. Or, or the forward or the intro. Uh -huh. um, does, he comes here from time to time, well, doesn't he? he? He's only been here twice. Okay. He's never come on retreat. He goes to uh, New Clairvaux in California a lot. Okay. That's kind of like his favorite spot in the world. Mm. And uh, he came here the first time with Diane April, who taught at uh, Spalding University. Okay. She, she did a book on Gethsemane called The Gethsemane of Place of Peace and Paradox. Mm. It's kind of a mm. coffee table book with lots of photographs in it. I like that title. Yeah. So uh, he was invited to the Festival of Faiths in Louisville. Okay. And uh, he wanted, as she brought him to Gethsemane, and I got to take him up to the Hermitage. And then he came, he was re invited to the Festival of Faiths eight years later. And so he wanted uh, to come, come visit again. Yeah. And uh, I took him up and we, we had a, I invited a group of writers and poets and we had a lovely evening. Mm. And um, then after that, uh, my editor suggested I invite him to do the foreword. Yeah. And he said he was thrilled. Yeah. <laughs> I, was, I was so surprised. <laughs> yeah. That's great. That's great. There's a line in his. Um, Ford, I just love, uh, he says, let's see here. He says, we're, we're joined at the root, even if our paths fly off in a hundred directions. Mm -hmm. And I love that. I love yeah. that. That's beautiful. Um, one of the things you say in the book is you describe prayer as breathing that purifies the air like mm -hmm. leaves on a tree. Mm -hmm. There's such a beautiful stillness in that statement. Um, yeah. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about just silence in prayer um, and just that, that stillness, that centeredness that, that does purify the air. Whether it's... Well, there's a, a kind of silence which comes from uh, uh, stilling the mind. Mm. Um, and you can develop that capacity, you know, how, how to uh, not fight thoughts so much as set them aside. Mm. Uh, it, it works in different ways. Uh, you can, uh, you know, if you want to, to, you know, be free, free your mind, uh, sometimes you have to use a little bit of a discipline in order to get to that point. And it, sometimes it might be a matter of, instead of fighting the thoughts, you just kind of stand above them like on a bridge and watch the, watch the uh, water flow by, yeah. but you're not involved, you don't get involved, you don't, you're, you're not attached to them. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes there's no water under the bridge, it's no problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you just, um, uh, instead of fighting them off, you're just, you know, you just stay still, you know, by intending to stay still. Yeah. But then there's a kind of silence that descends upon you. And it's like the presence of, uh, it happens on its own. And that's, that's really special. Mm -hmm. uh, you may not, you may get that or you may not get it. Uh, and sometimes it's, you know, you're not all that aware, aware of it when it happens necessarily. But um, it, it's, it's not a, a matter of looking for it. Mm. Because if you're looking for it, then you're thinking of something. Yeah. You, you have an expectation, and you're dealing with your expectation. Yeah, kind, and also kind of like if you experience it and you name it, you lose it. Precisely, yeah. <laughs> yeah then you stop being in it, mm -hmm. or just being it. Mm -hmm. In a way, it's kind of like uh, drifting off to sleep. Mm -hmm. I, you don't know the moment you drifted off to sleep. Yeah. Uh, if you do, you're not asleep. <laughs> 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 and so I, I think that you know the the arrival of the spirit happens very much the same way. Mm -hmm. And maybe you don't, you know, you you walk away without thinking. Uh, it, without thinking that anything happened, but that's okay. 
um, you don't judge. Maybe more was happening than you were sensible of. of. Mm. And maybe it's better that way, that you're, you're feeling that, well, this was just a useless time. Mm. But uh, that's kind of the point, to be useless for God. <laughs> I love while. that. If you love somebody, you know, you're mm. willing just to, you know, sit, sit with them while and, and uh, chat or not chat. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and the intimacy and not chatting sometimes is mm -hmm. so potent. Yeah, one of my better friends now, I have, we have a nice conversation, and then all this kind of things, conversation just goes into a law, and we both feel perfectly comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know, maybe he's learned that from me, uh, mm -hmm. uh, he never said, but it's, uh, it's like, he knows that's special. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So you've been here for how many years? Well, as of a uh, week after next, it'll be 60 years. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, Congratulations. I, I, I arrived here, in, I think it's around the 23rd or something in July, okay. 1958. Okay. Um, and after, you know, that many years of, of ritual and, and prayer, um, how many times a day? Seven times a day Seven in choir, and then mm -hmm. of course Mass, mm -hmm. making number eight. Do you still encounter those distractions and those oh, yeah. things that come up? Yeah. yeah. But, you know, uh, like... Like today, thinking, well, is Cassidy Hall here, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> and what, will I recognize her? And, <laughs> and then, oh, I get to the end of the office and say, oh, gee, I haven't been following the words of, of the songs. <laughs> <laughs> so then I have to, you know, finish up by paying more attention, short as the time remaining might be. Mm -hmm. But that's, you know, you just take that for granted. I mean, some days you're paying attention and some days you're not. You, you don't want to beat yourself over the head about it. And, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And there's something just so important about that, like you were saying earlier, that gentleness with oneself mm -hmm. to see those things and then let them pass. Yeah. Reminds me a lot of the some of the centering prayer techniques that Father oh, Keating discusses. Oh, yeah, right. and, um, just acknowledging it uh -huh. and just letting it pass and coming yeah. back. Um, I love what you said. There, you did this interview in 2011. I'm trying to remember who it was with, but um, you were talking about the concept of, of arriving. Um, and you said, we never get there. Um, you, you were discussing when people ask you how long you've been here or, or you know, when you entered the monastic community. And you said, we never get there. As Merton said, you know, if you think you've arrived, you're lost. People in the world come here on retreat. They ask me, how long have you been here? I answer as, what, another elsewhere 52 years. But it is a fiction. How long have I been here? Excuse me, I haven't gotten he here yet. <laughs> <laughs> and I just love that. And this, yeah, this... That's, that's just the beginning. It, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a longer poem than that. Mm, okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. It's, yeah. Where's that found? It's in, um, I think it's in Bells of the Hours. Okay, okay. Yeah. Pe people ask me how long you've been here. I say 60 years, but it is a fiction. Mm -hmm. I used to live by months and years. Now, if I can just bump through a day, I'll leave time to the bells. Mm. and bear the moment for all it's worth. Meanwhile, a truckload of time has just come roaring in to empty, sort, and stack. How long have I been here? Excuse me, I haven't gotten here yet. Mm. Oh, I love that. <laughs> I love that. It actually reminds me a little bit of... Um, there's this great portion in um, the essay Day of a Stranger by Murray. Oh, yes. Um, and he ends this fantastic string of thoughts with, it is not interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and you just kind of feel shocked, but um, 
it just again going back to and the word you brought up earlier um the title of a book you mentioned the the paradox and kind of living in that that space where things make sense seems to so often be the space of paradox and the space of mm -hmm. just mind-boggling things that seem to not make sense together um well, my next book is called Amounting to Nothing. Oh. <laughs> and the first first part of it is yeah. called Getting Nowhere. Mm. And then the second part is called Busy with Non-Doing. Oh, wonderful. Oh, wonderful. In Unquiet Vigil, you talk a lot about writing as a way of keeping vigil. Uh, and I love this idea of this staying awake to life through writing. Um, and how has that practice impacted your life and how has that been something important for you? Well, um, yeah, it sort of gives me a sense of uh, creativity. Um, it's there's some, something that Eric Erickson calls generativity. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, people find different ways of, uh, it, it's this, it's a final stage of maturity. So in the process of being able to, you know, you, I like using my mind that way, it just comes. And uh, I've developed a habit of, you know, uh, harnessing these uh, um, thought, thoughts that come to me, and, and they've been coming to me, you know, for decades now, but I didn't always harness them into mm. words. Mm -hmm. But um, in, the, in the process of writing, you um, uh, can make what are rather, rather private thoughts something you can share with other people. Uh, of course, there's a discipline in doing the revision and the revision and the revision, all yeah. in the interest of being true to the original intuition. Mm. Make the thought more of what it really is. Mm. And so that's that's where writing, and it's just it's nice to have something to work on for a while and you know, yeah. um, stop worrying about other things. Yeah. And uh, so I would say it's given be a certain kind of a freedom, uh, you know, it's a pl place I can go and uh, spend some time on something rather than, other than just the usual routine. Um, I don't always get as much time as I, I would like to, and sometimes I have more time than I can make good use of, and there's nothing creative going on. So, mm. you know, it's, you have to stay detached from it. Mm. Um, I'm not compulsive as a writer. I'm not trying to make a living with it. Uh, some people have to write, like Merton. But uh, I, I can live without it. But it's better to live with it. Mm. Hmm. And you said Merton had encouraged you to write. Um, Is that right? I don't know. I think uh, one of my teachers at uh, St. Peter's High School said mm. I should. She said, you have a style. Mm. And uh, I don't know, he never, I mean, I, sh I, I read him a poem. That you had written. I had written uh -huh. uh, early on. Well, he liked it. He put it uh, up on the bulletin board. So that's about as much an encouragement as <laughs> uh, you would ever expect. Yeah. But he never pressed, well, in fact, he, uh, he told me I should keep a journal. But he said that to all the novices. Mm. He said, otherwise you'd lose a moment. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. good moment. And, and I, I was a disobedient novice. I didn't keep a journal. So, <laughs> uh, then I, 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 at a certain point in my life, did, I started keeping a journal. Then I found out you have to spend so much time writing your journal that uh, <laughs> I didn't want to do it anymore. Yeah, it's too much work. Yeah. <laughs> um, when it comes to, to Thomas Merton's Hermitage, you say, um, you talk about the cinder block shelter, nothing much to look at in itself, functions as a lens 
that focuses visitors soon on what they truly are. In such a place we find our true self. And obviously that, that true self concept was in, heavily woven in, in so much of, of Merton's writings. And mm -hmm. I wonder if that's impacted your life and oh, well, sure. And yeah. how that's uh, influenced you. Well, yeah. Um, it's, I, it's, it's not like an outside impact coming in so much <laughs> as uh, something that comes naturally mm -hmm. uh, in the context of silence and uh, living the monastic life. You just kind of, you get free of a lot of preoccupations and then you just kind of move into that. Uh, and you're at rest and you know, well, this, this is really what I want to be. This is what I really am. Uh, and you don't just toot, toot a horn about it. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, um, uh, you, you may not even think in terms of true self, false self. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, I don't think in those terms that myself that much. Okay. Uh, probably because of Merton, I think of that uh, in those terms more than I usually would. Um, and I'm not sure I would have any terms if it wasn't for Merton. Mm -hmm. uh, ego is kind of like a common, common place now. People talk about the ego, and that's something to think about. But um, the uh, what, what was the question again? Just if the that true self concept has has impacted your life and. And if, if it has, then, you know, how or how have you harnessed that thought into tending to your well, true self? Well, I think, you know, it's uh, something that you uh, naturally feel true to, mm. or, you, or you, want it, you naturally want to feel true to. It's not something that impacts from the outside. Yeah. It's something that you, you reckon, acknowledge and, uh, you know, stay... Uh, in, 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 in continuity with, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the, uh, the, the only way to live a life like this is by doing that, mm -hmm. otherwise you're, you're going to be very dissatisfied and you're going to be wanting something else. Uh, it, it just fits the context. So that, that's how it all seems to me. And I mean, uh, uh, one of the uh, se senior priests accused Father Lewis of being psychological. It's not spirituality, it's psychology. <laughs> All this business about the mm -hmm. true self, false self. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I, I, I don't think that's valid, particularly. Um, you can get preoccupied with your own psychology, and um, it's good to know yourself. I mean, that's one of the... Uh, capital uh, precepts of the Desert Fathers and, uh, and s s monks and philosophers going back to Socrates, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, know yourself. Mm -hmm. um, but knowing yourself can mean different things in different contexts. So, uh, you know, uh, there are Sometimes in periods in my life where I've had to fo focus on that more than others, mm -hmm. and then you cover so much ground, and then you kind of uh, go on into a plateau, and then you might have to, uh, you know, sort of uh, do some revision and do some updating and do some growing. So all these things are just the natural pattern of life, I think. So. When did you, I mean, after coming here at 17, when did you know that this was your vocational calling? Um, or, or was there ever a point where you said, okay, this is it, and... Um, and I can't say I ever...